Hello and welcome to Insight of Thermology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to another important lecture. Today we are studying the anatomy of the extraocular muscles. For the purpose of better understanding, we have divided this video into three parts in which the first part will be dealing with the anatomy of the rectus muscles. In the second part, we shall be talking in detail about the obliques muscle of the eye and in the third part, we shall be studying in detail and understanding the extraocular movements. So in this first part, in this lecture, we shall be studying about the classification of the various muscles of the eye, the anatomy of the rectus muscles in the eye, that means their origin, course and insertion, the important measurements and axes which are pertaining to the rectus muscles, the annulus of Zinn, tenons fascia and capsule, the various muscle pulleys specifically to the recti, the spiral of the locks, and finally we shall be closing the lecture with the nerve and blood supply of the extraocular muscles. So without any delay, let's get started. The ocular muscles can be classified into the extraocular muscles and the intraocular muscles. Extraocular muscles are those muscles which are present outside the eyeball, whereas the intraocular muscles are the muscles which are present within the eyeball, right? So within the eyeball, we have the ciliaris muscles, then we have the sphincter pupillae and the dilator pupillae. Now these are basically present in the ciliary body and in the iris. The extraocular muscles can again be divided into the involuntary muscles on which we do not have any voluntary control like the superior tarsal muscle and the inferior tarsal muscles which are present in the tarsal plate of the eyelids. And then we have the voluntary group of muscles and in this lecture we shall be basically focusing on this important group of voluntary extraocular muscles. Now the voluntary extraocular muscles are basically the total seven in number. We have the levator palpebral superioris which is present in the upper eyelid. Then we have four recti. These are superior rectus, inferior rectus, lateral rectus and medial rectus. Then we have two obliques muscles which are the superior oblique and the inferior oblique. The meaning of rectus basically means that straight, okay? So obliques as the name suggests, they have an oblique course and that's why they are called obliques. So superior oblique and inferior oblique, they have an oblique course in the orbit. Whereas when you talk about the rectus, rectus have mostly a straight course in the orbit and therefore they are given the name recti. Okay, so now as I told you, there are basically four rectus, the superior rectus, which is sitting on top of the eyeball and therefore it is called superior. Then we have the medial rectus, which is situated medially, that is towards the nose and therefore it's called the medial rectus. The inferior rectus, which is situated below the eyeball. And then we have the lateral rectus, which is situated uh, on the lateral aspect of the eyeball. Now, in this picture, you can see the same group of muscles have been actually uh, shown in a sagittal section, right? So, we have over here, this one is a lateral rectus, okay, because it is away from the nose. And on the opposite side, we will have the medial rectus. Then we have this, which is the superior rectus over here. And then we'll have this one, which is called the inferior rectus. The muscles which you can see coming like this obliquely, these are the obliques muscles. And these oblique muscles we'll be dealing with in the next part of the video. Now, these muscles are not, uh, the recti are not, are not just hanging in isolation in the orbit. So, if you take a section like this of the eyeball, okay, this is the superior rectus and this is the lateral rectus, the medial rectus and the inferior rectus. These are actually interconnected with some thin connected tissue and that thin connected tissue because it is present in between these muscles, it is called the intermuscular septum, right? So, these muscles along with that intermuscular muscular septum is if you see it is actually dividing the uh, uh, the orbit into basically two parts the part which is present outside the uh, muscles and the intra, uh, intramuscular septum is called the extra conal space and the part which is present in between these muscles and the intramuscular septum is called the intra conal space okay so let me explain it to you why it is called a cone 
Now, if you observe, the muscles are actually, the recti are basically originating somewhere posteriorly, okay? And then they are coming and traveling straight like this. So, superior rectus, inferior rectus, the later rectus, and then we have the medial rectus on the other side. So, if you notice, they are actually forming a conical shape within themselves. And that conical space is called the intraconal space. And the space which is present outside that cone is called the extraconal space, which basically consists of the fat in the orbit. Now, here we will be dividing this lecture into anatomy of the recti muscle and the anatomy of the obliques muscle. So, first let us talk about the anatomy of the recti muscle and starting with the common origin of the recti. So, uh, as the slide tells you, the recti, that is the superior, medial, lateral and inferior recti, they have a common origin. And from where are they arising? They are arising from the posterior aspect of the orbit, right? On the posterior aspect of the orbit, there is an origin of the recti which is called the annulus of Zinn. So, let me explain it to you what is meant by this annulus of zin. Now look at this skull. In the skull, that hole that you see over there is called the optic canal. The optic canal is a structure from where the optic nerve will basically pass through. Then just lateral to the optic canal, you have a superior orbital fissure, right? And then below that, you have an inferior orbital fissure. So these three things are very important to understand the annulus of zin. Now what happens is, considering the optic canal, superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure over here, a, th a, a, a tendinous or a facial ring is actually attached over here, enclosing the optic uh, canal and the superior orbital fissure and that tendinous ring is called the annulus of the zin. Okay, behind uh, after the name of the scientist who named it. Now, the importance of this annulus of Zinn is that, as you can see, this is the annulus of Zinn. And as I told you, it surrounds the optic canal and also surrounds part of the superior orbital fissure, right? So, here in this section, you can see this is the optic nerve. Now, if you actually notice, all the recti are actually taking origin. All the recti are originating from this common tendinous ring. So this over here is your superior rectus. This is the medial rectus over here. And then we have the lateral rectus. And inferiorly, you have the inferior rectus. Okay, so all the recti will take origin from the annulus of Zinn. However, when you talk about obliques, they do not take origin from the annulus of Zinn. So that is a very important um, differentiating point between the rectus and the obliques. Now, what is the clinical importance of this annulus of Zinn? Now, as I told you that the superior rectus and the medial rectus, they... Uh, uh, for that matter, all the recti, they are originating from the annulus of Zinn. However, the superior rectus and the medial rectus, they will have uh, dense adhesions with the dural sheath of the optic nerve. So, this is the optic nerve. Optic nerve is surrounded by the meninges, okay? So, it has a dural sheath. Sometimes, this superior rectus and the medial rectus sheaths, okay, the muscular sheaths will be uh, closely adhered to this dural sheath of the optic nerve. So, what happens in certain diseases like optic neuritis, in which we have inflammation of the optic nerve, the inflammatory cells will also uh, get transferred to the sheath of the extraocular muscle, specifically the superior rectus and medial rectus. So, what happens whenever the person will use, whenever the patient uses superior rectus or medial rectus, that means when he wants to elevate the eyeball or wants to look towards the nose, which is called adduction, there will be pain in the eye. Okay, so therefore in optic neuritis, we have painful eye movements, specifically on up gaze and adduction. Now, uh, talking about the cores of the muscle, so as you can see over here, okay, so you can see that this is the common tendinous ring. From here, all the muscles are originating and the recti, as the name suggests, they are basically going to travel straight. Okay, so here the lateral rectus has been removed so as to show you the optic nerve over here. So the lateral rectus passes like this. Okay, then we have the superior rectus passing like this. Then we have the inferior rectus and on the other side we have the medial rectus. If you observe the medial rectus almost passes, the medial rectus almost passes, you know, parallel to the medial wall of the orbit. Whereas the superior rectus, if you can see here, the superior rectus actually is slightly diverging from the common tendinous origin and the lateral rectus is mostly, it is the muscle which diverges the most, right? And that happens because of the divergent nature of our uh, orb orbit. 
Now, uh, before we go uh, into the axis of the various muscles, first we should understand what is meant by the tenons fascia or fascia bulbi, right? So, as I told you that the muscles are not just hanging, they're, they're actually interconnecting, uh, connected to each other with certain intermuscular septums, right? So, apart from that, there's also a thin membrane which envelops the eyeball right from the optic nerve uh, to the corneal limbus which is situated here, okay? So, the limbus is nothing, it is a point, it's a junction between the cornea and the conjunctiva. So, we have a thin membrane which is coming right from the optic nerve up to this limbus encircling the eyeball completely and separating the eyeball from the outside uh, fat which is present in the orbit, right? So, posteriorly this is, this, and this encircling or this encircling membrane as you can be seen over here okay this is actually starting and posteriorly from the optic nerve sheath and anteriorly it is going to fuse with that intermuscular septum okay it's about three millimeters posterior to the limbus so we have this nice uh, protective covering around the eyeball into which even the uh, muscles are actually suspended and this is called the tenons fascia or fascia bulbi now why is it why is it so important it's important because whenever you want to do surgeries on the muscle, the muscles are situated and inserted onto the sclera. So you cannot reach the muscle without actually giving an incision into the tenons capsule or tenons fascia. So your plane of in, uh, dissection will be first you take a nick on the conjunctiva. After you reflect the conjunctiva, you have to go down and find the tenons capsule. So you dissect the tenons capsule, then you reach the intermuscular septum and then you will finally reach the muscle. So that is very important. Now, another important point which I want you to know is this factor that the muscles which are coming from behind, that means the recti, superior, inferior, medial and lateral, they are going to actually pierce the tenons capsule. And as they pierce the tenons capsule, they are going to carry a sleeve of the tenons uh, connected tissue along with them and that sleeve is called the muscle pulley. Okay, and where do they actually pierce this tenons capsule? They pierce it about 10 millimeters from the limbal area. So, uh, because uh, the muscles are going to pierce the tenons capsule, they are going to take away some sleeves of connected tissue along with them and those sleeves are called the muscle pulleys. Okay, so all these over here, these are called the muscle pulleys around the muscle. So, you can see this muscle pulleys are actually suspending the muscle from the adjacent orbital wall and also they are connecting them to the tenons capsule. They are made up of collagen, elastin and smooth muscles. Now, importance of this muscle pulleys is that, that although we know that the anatomical origin of the rectus muscle is from the common tendinous ring, the functional origin of the muscle is actually from these pulleys okay so muscle pulleys will act as functional origin of the muscle so i will tell you in a while what is meant by the functional origin of the muscle right now another important uh function of the muscle pulleys is that it prevents a displacement of the muscle during the movement of the eyeball. Now, for example, let us take an example of this muscle over here, considering that this is a muscle and this is the origin from where it is coming and this is a point where it is actually inserting, right? Now, here this is the muscle pulley. Now, in the primary gaze, that means the patient is actually looking straight ahead, the muscle position is somewhat like this shown in picture 1. Now, in picture 2, the patient tries to look upside, okay, in the upward direction. So, in this upward direction, the eye takes an elevation position and in this elevated position, you can see this is a muscle pulley and only the anterior part of the muscle has actually got displaced and the posterior part of the muscle is still straight in position or still straight in the orientation. So, that is the function of the pulley. Although the anatomical origin is present over here, the muscle does not move from this anatomical origin. Instead, because of the stabilization which is being provided by this pulley, the muscle is only getting distorted or, or getting displaced at the pulley or the distal muscle, the muscle which is distal to the pulley is getting displaced and therefore this pulley is acting like the functional origin of the extraocular muscle. Now, in order to understand the axis of insertion of the various recti muscle, uh, some basic uh, knowledge of the anatomy of the orbit is also very, very important. Considering this to be the two orbits of uh, 
a human skull so these are the medial walls okay the medial walls as you can see they are approximately parallel to each other right and the lateral walls are at an angle of 90 degrees to each other in such a way that the medial and the lateral wall they are actually forming an angle of 45 degrees to each other now what about the visual axis or the optical axis the optical axis is an axis which pass, uh, passes from the center of the cornea to the fovea like this so this optical axis if you see is straight ahead whereas the orbital axis is something which is passing from the center of the orbit to, uh, going behind to the orbital apex the orbital axis and the optical axis if you see they are not coinciding with each other however they are actually forming an angle and this angle is about 22.5 or 23 degrees okay so this is very important that the orbital axis and the optical axis they are not aligned to each other they have an angle of about 23 degrees why is it important because most of the rectile muscles specifically here i'm talking about the superior rectus and the inferior rectus they will actually follow the angle of orbital axis okay and therefore when they are going to get inserted over here they are going to form an angle of 23 degrees with the optical axis now this knowledge becomes very important when you try to understand the uh, movements of the extraocular muscles now uh, I what, uh, what did i tell you the orbital axis and the visual axis they are forming an angle of 23 degrees with each other Similarly, the superior and the inferior rectus which are following the orbital axis. So, as you can see, this is the superior rectus. And then below that, we will have the inferior rectus which is just parallel to this. So, both of them, their, their angle, their line of sight is like this and the visual axis is like this. So, definitely the angle between them is how much? It is 23 degrees. Okay. Next, what about the medial rectus? The medial rectus is passing almost parallel to the medial wall of the or, uh, orbit or almost parallel to the visual axis so the medial rectus will not form any angulation with the visual axis coming to the lateral rectus the lateral rectus is passing al along the lateral wall of the orbit and therefore it is also following that angle of about 45 degrees with the visual axis so this is very important to understand to understand the uh, extraocular muscle movements after you know the course of the muscle, we should know about the insertion of the rectile muscle. Now, this diagram actually uh, shows you that the muscles are originating from the posterior aspect of the orbit. That means the annulus of Zinn is situated near the orbital apex. Okay, And then the muscles are traveling forward like this and now they are going to get inserted on to the anterior aspect of the eyeball so from where are the muscles originating they are originating from the posterior and getting inserted on the anterior aspect at certain distances from the limbus and what are these distances if you consider the medial rectus the medial rectus is inserted about at a distance of 5.5 millimeters from the limbus the inferior rectus is getting inserted at a distance of about 6.5 millimeters from the limbus the lateral rectus is getting inserted at a distance of 6.9 and the superior rectus is getting inserted at a distance of 7.7 .7 millimeters now why is it all important if you actually observe this the medial rectus is the closest to the limbus and the superior rectus is the farthest from the limbus now if you join the insertion points of all these muscles you are going to get a line like this which will not be a perfect kind of uh, circle but instead will be a spiral like this okay so this spiral which is formed by an imaginary line connecting the insertions of the rectile muscle of the eye is called the spiral of tilox now how do you actually remember so the mnemonic over here is the slim rule in the slim rule s stands for superior rectus that means it is farthest away from the limbus at a distance of 7.7 .7 millimeters and m stands for medial rectus which is nearest to the limbus about 5.5 .5. so remember 5.5 .5, 6.5 6.9 and 7.7 .7 millimeters now this is very important this has a clinical significance 
Spiral of the locks can actually act as an important landmark in strabismus surgery. It helps a surgeon to find out exactly where is the muscle present by measuring the distance of the muscle insertion from the limbus. Moreover, the sclera is also thinnest at the point where the rectus muscle will get inserted and the thickness of the sclera at the insertion of the rectus muscle is about 0.3 mm. This is important because this is also a very common site for perforation during severe blunt trauma to the globe. So that is how this, in, this knowledge about the insertion of rectus muscle becomes important. Let's talk about these muscles individually. The first one that we'll talk about is the medial rectus. Now, medial rectus arises from the medial edge of the common tendinous ring of Zinn, which is present at the orbital apex. Now, the second picture over here actually shows you the relationships of the medial rectus. So, this is the medial rectus, which is arising from the medial aspect of the tendinous ring. And you can see lateral to it, we have the optic canal, which is actually harboring the optic nerve along with the ophthalmic artery. Now, this is very important because the medial medial rectus will share its uh, sheath with the dural sheath of the optic nerve and therefore in optic neuritis most of the time when the patient uh, is using medial rectus to look medially there will be painful eye movements right and that happens in optic neuritis so uh, because of a common sheath between medial rectus and uh, and the optic nerve the same thing also happens with the superior rectus because superior rectus just like the medial rectus also has a common sheath with the optic nerve dural sheath as i told you it travels parallel to the medial wall of the orbit and gets inserted at a distance of 5.5 millimeters from the uh, limbus. Now certain advanced measurements that we should know is the width, length and the tendon length of the muscle. The width is about 10.3, the length is 40.8 and the tendon length is 3.7 millimeters. Now the width and length for most of the muscles are almost similar. They are, they are in the order of 10 and the length is almost somewhere between 30 to 40. Okay. Now the tendon length however varies from muscle to muscle. Now here if you have to remember one point remember that the medial rectus has the second shortest tendon the shortest tendon belongs to inferior oblique however the second shortest tendon is that of the medial rectus what about the lateral rectus as you can see the lateral rectus is arising from the lateral aspect of the tendon uh, the common tendinous origin of zin and you can see this is the uh, this is the cross section which is showing the origin of the lateral rectus. The lateral rectus is in close association with quite important, quite a lot of important structures which are passing through the superior orbital fissure. So laterally, if you see, this is the superior ophthalmic vein. Apart from that, there is this lacrimal nerve, the frontal nerve and the trochlear nerve. So you can remember it with the mnemonic of LFT where L stands for lacrimal, F stands for frontal and T stands for the trochlear nerve which is also called the fourth grade nerve medial to the uh, lateral rectus we have the third nerve superior division okay then we have the sixth nerve and we also have the nasociliary nerve so these important relations are uh, res uh, related to the lateral rectus so uh, this can be the path of the lateral rectus can be seen and you can see that it is inserted at 6.9 millimeters from the limbus. The width, as I told you, is somewhere close to 10. The length is about 40 and the tendon length is about 8 millimeter. You can see the tendon length is much bigger than that of what we have seen in case of medial rectus. What about the inferior rectus? The inferior rectus arises from the inferior part of the tendinous uh, of the uh, the zin okay so as you can see this is the inferior rectus and below the inferior rectus you have the inferior oblique so this is an important relation to remember that the inferior oblique is present below the inferior rectus muscle okay now what about the important uh, what about the important uh, relations of the inferior rectus? The inferior rectus is related to the inferior ophthalmic vein. It is related to the inferior, uh, the infraorbital nerve along with the infraorbital artery and also related to the zygomatic nerve. And uh, above that you can see there is this inferior division of the third nerve which will also supply the inferior rectus. 
what about some of the measurements of inferior rectus inferior rectus is actually inserted at a distance of 6.5 millimeters from the limbus okay the width is 9.8 length is 40 and the tendon length is about 5.5 millimeters what about the superior rectus? The superior rectus is arising from the superior aspect of the uh, tendinous origin. So you can see this is the superior rectus. Above the superior rectus, you have the levator palpebrae superioris. Okay. So if you if you notice the the superior rectus is present like this, and above that you have the LPS. Whereas the inferior rectus is present like this, and below that we have the inferior oblique muscle. So that is one important uh, relation. Apart from that, one more feature that you should remember is, uh, is that uh, during the origin, as you can see over here, the LPS is actually originating and situated, situated above the level of the superior rectus. So this is the superior rectus and the LPS has been removed in this picture to show you that the LPS is actually situated above the level of superior rectus. And if you want to see superior rectus, you have to remove that LPS, right? The second important relation is that of the superior oblique. The superior oblique is actually arising, uh, is arising somewhere um, superior medially or uh, medial aspect of the tendons, common tendinous origin. However, it travels above the medial rectus and you can see over here from the pulley, it is coming in such a way that the insertion of the superior oblique is actually below the level of the superior rectus insertion. So that is important. At the level of insertion, superior oblique is inferior to the superior rectus insertion, right? So LPS is always above the superior rectus and superior oblique insertion is below the superior rectus uh, insertion. So we have superior rectus, then we have the superior oblique insertion and at the inferior, in, at the inferior aspect of the eyeball, we have the inferior rectus first and then we have the inferior oblique. So I hope that is clear. So coming to the advanced measurements, you can see the width, width is about 10.6, length is 41.8 and the tendon length is 5.8 millimeters. Now, before we go to the nerve supply of the extraocular muscle, it is very important to understand this superior orbital fissure and some important uh, structures which are passing through this superior orbital fissure. We know that the the, uh, the ring of Zin or the common tendinous ring is actually encircling the optic canal through which the optic nerve is actually passing along with the ophthalmic artery. Okay, so and then we have the superior orbital fissure. Now, the common tendinous ring will actually divide the superior orbital fissure into three parts. So, we have this part over here. This is the lateral part or the superior quadrant, the middle part and then the inferior part. The inferior part and the structure which is passing through it is very easy to remember. You can see only the inferior ophthalmic vein actually passes through the inferior aspect of the superior orbital fissure. Whereas the lateral part or the upper part of the superior orbital fissure, you can remember it with the mnemonic of LFP. Okay, so L stands for the lacrimal nerve, F stands for the frontal nerve, T stands for the trochlear nerve. And important over here is the trochlear nerve. Okay, and uh, again, one more vein is there which is called the superior ophthalmic vein. Now, what about the middle compartment? In the middle compartment, what we have is the third nerve, the sixth nerve, and along with that, we have the nasociliary nerve, right? So, the third nerve has again superior division and inferior division. Both the divisions will pass through the middle compartment along with the nasociliary nerve and the abducent nerve, which is the sixth nerve. So, for us to understand the nerve supply of the extraocular muscle, we have to know that the nerves which are of importance to us are the third nerve, the sixth nerve and the fourth nerve. And where are they passing through? The third and the sixth nerve are passing through the center compartment of the superior orbital fissure and the fourth nerve is passing through the lateral compartment or the superior compartment of the superior orbital fissure. And what is dividing these compartments? The ring of Zin or the origin of Zin is actually dividing the superior orbital fissure into the three compartments. Look at this picture. This picture is as if you are directly looking at the intramuscular cone after removing of the eyeball. So this shows you that most of the muscles are getting their nerve supply from the internal aspect, right? So whether it is lateral rectus, superior rectus, 
medial rectus or the inferior rectus all are getting uh, the blood supply from the internal aspect except one muscle that is the superior oblique which you can see the nerve is passing on the outer aspect of the superior rectus and then from the outer side it is going and supplying the superior oblique right now as you already know that the third nerve is present in the center most compartment and it has the two divisions superior division and inferior division the superior division of the third nerve will supply the superior rectus that is here and along with that supplies the levator palpebrae superioris the inferior division of the third nerve will supply the medial rectus and the inferior rectus and also supplies the inferior oblique muscle now what about the superior oblique muscle which is situated here the superior oblique muscle as you can see supplied by this nerve which is crossing on the outer aspect of the superior rectus and then supplying the superior oblique this is the trochlear nerve or the fourth cranial nerve which is situated in the upper aspect or the lateral aspect of the superior orbital fissure then we have the lateral rectus which is supplied by the sixth nerve which is again situated in the central compartment of the superior orbital fissure so a mnemonic which helps you to uh, remember this innovation is the lr6 so4 and rest is by 3 LR6 means lateral rectus is supplied by the 6th cranial nerve, the superior oblique is supplied by the 4th cranial nerve and the remaining all the nerves, are, all the uh, extraocular muscles are supplied by the branches of the 3rd cranial nerve which is the ocular motor nerve. Coming to the blood supply, the blood supply of the extraocular muscles is basically coming from the ophthalmic artery and in particular because they are the mus muscles, it is coming from the muscular branches of the ophthalmic artery. Now, the ophthalmic artery has basically two types of muscular arteries. These can be the medial muscular arteries and the lateral muscular arteries. These muscular arteries are going to further subdivide and branch and form about seven anterior ciliary arteries. And it is these ciliary arteries which will go and supply the muscles. Now, this happens in such a way that the medial ones are going to go to the medial rectus, inferior rectus and inferior oblique and the lateral ones will go to the lateral rectus, superior rectus, superior oblique and these levator palpebrae superioris. Now as you can see the muscular arteries over here they are going to branch and finally they are going to form the anterior ciliary arteries and there are about seven anterior ciliary arteries they are actually arising from the muscular arteries. Every muscle will have about two anterior ciliary arteries. However, the lateral rectus is a loner. The lateral rectus has only one anterior ciliary artery. So that is one important thing to remember. Apart from that, there's one more important aspect, clinical uh, significant uh, factor, or you can say the clinical significant nugget regarding the anterior ciliary artery. The anterior ciliary artery, as you can see, is joining with the long posterior ciliary artery and forming two important arterial circles, episcleral arterial circle and the major arterial circle, which are basically responsible for, uh, for the blood supply of the anterior segment of the eye. Now, how is it important? It is important because whenever we operate on the muscle, there is a chance that we, can, we might damage the anterior ciliary arteries. So, therefore, it is often advised that we do not operate on more than two recti muscle in one eye because then we will be damaging more amount of anterior ciliary arteries and these arterial circles will be compromised leading to ischemia of the anterior segment. Moreover, what is important over here uh, to remember is that the arterial circles, about 70% of the blood supply in those uh, arterial circles is contributed by the anterior ciliary arteries and about only 30% is contributed by the long posterior ciliary arteries. Moreover, along the uh, vertical recti, whether it's superior recti or the inferior recti, the LPCA are basically absent. The long posterior ciliary arteries are absent and therefore at those locations, it is only the anterior ciliary arteries which are actually, uh, you know, providing the blood flow to the arterial circles. And therefore, surgeries on these vertical muscles are more risky and they have more risk of development of the anterior segment ischemia. So, that's all for today. Thank you and have a nice day. In the next segment, we shall be studying about the obliques of the eye.